uh, really pleased to be here tonight and really thank PPMD for inviting me to do this presentation. I'm a professor of, of neurology at the University of Pittsburgh and have worked with uh, an industry NS Pharma on um, the study of Vilta Larsen and was the study chair for their phase two studies. And what I'm going to tell you about tonight is um, those phase, uh, the phase two extension study uh, of Vilta Larsen, which is an FDA approved treatment for patients with Duchenne who have deletion mutations that are amenable to exon 53 skipping. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'm going to start by giving you just a, a brief background of the dose finding study that led up to the long-term study uh, results that I'm going to sh be showing you today. Next slide. So uh, this um, study was studied two different doses of Vilta Larsen, a 40 milligram per kilogram per week dose and an 80 milligram per kilogram per week dose. Uh, eight participants were uh, enrolled at the 40 milligram per kilogram dose, and then that was followed by a second group of eight participants at the 80 milligram per kilogram dose. And each of the participants um, was treated in what's called an open label, which means that there was no placebo control, um, except at the very beginning uh, to test for safety such that each participant in the initial dose finding study had 20 or 24 weeks of uh, treatment with Vilta Larsen. Uh, next slide. So um, uh, the study had several endpoints. Uh, the primary endpoint for this dose finding study was a uh, biomarker study, a biomarker, and the biomarker was the expression of dystrophin in muscle. Uh, so these participants had a muscle biopsy at the beginning of the study before any treatment, and then they had a second muscle biopsy done at 24 weeks uh, after receiving uh, treatment over that period. Um, their uh, safety and tolerability, uh, as well as drug levels, were carefully followed, and then there were a series of secondary uh, outcomes that I won't um, report on uh, tonight. These are this is all um, studies that have been uh, published. Uh, next slide. So uh, just to highlight the key eligibility criteria to be in the study, the participants were all between four and 10 years of age at the start of the study. They were able to walk independently um, and uh, they were all on a stable dose of glucocorticoids. Uh, there were a series of exclusion criteria just to provide for safety of the participants in the study. Uh, next slide. This slide just gives you the baseline demographics to show that each of the two groups, the 40 milligram per kilogram, kilogram group and the 80 milligram per kilogram group were quite similar in terms of age, uh, height, weight, et cetera. Next slide. And this is the uh, uh, important um, outcome slide that I'm going to show you for this dose finding study. Uh, we're showing here the eight participants that were in the 80 milligram per kilogram dose uh, and showing their pretreatment uh, muscle biopsy dystrophin level, uh, as well as on the right side of the slide, their post-treatment um, uh, dystrophin level in muscle in muscle biopsy. And so you can see that all participants showed an increase of varying amounts, um, but seven of the eight uh, showed over or at 3% of dystrophin by the end of this study, um, showing that Vilta Larsen did increase um, the level of dystrophin in muscle, which was the primary outcome that led to uh, FDA approval uh, on the accelerated pathway. Uh, next slide. So with that as background, now what I wanted to show you as the new data tonight which is the open label extension study. And so this all uh, 16 participants in the dose finding study had the opportunity to continue 
into a, uh, an extension study where they received uh, treatment. And, uh, and all 16 participants uh, um, chose to continue on in the extension study. Next slide. So again, just showing the graphic of the slide uh, of the, of the uh, study schema um, and um, highlighted in the white box there is just showing the extent, extension phase for each of the two dose levels. Uh, next slide. So the primary outcome for this extension study is a clinical outcome. It was the, it, it was the time to stand, um, which is uh, the time required to stand from supine. And the secondary outcomes were the other typical clinical outcomes that are used in uh, Duchenne clinical studies. And uh, as always, safety was assessed throughout this, this open label study. Next slide. Uh, the primary inclusion criteria was uh, simply that um, the participants had completed the dose finding study and were continuing on glucocorticoids. Next slide. So uh, let me, this is the primary outcome. And uh, so let me just carefully walk you through this slide. Um, the uh, left-hand graph is showing the time to stand measured in seconds. And the right-hand uh, graph is taking that same time to stand, but converting the measurement to a velocity by uh, taking one rise divided by the number of seconds. It's just a, another way to represent um, the time to stand uh, measurement. Uh, the uh, Viltilarsen is shown in the navy blue uh, line. And uh, because this was an open label study and didn't have a placebo, it was compared to an external comparator. Um, and that's shown in the, in the tan line. Now, <laughs> the use of an external comparator is important because it clearly needs to match the group that was used, that was in the open label study. And in this case, that um, external comparator group was taken from a data set that was provided by the Synergy Duchenne Natural History Study that many of you I know have heard of um, and, have, and many of you I'm sure have participated in. Um, and this is a prospectively collected observational data set. And uh, what a study such as this can do is essentially take its eligibility criteria as a means of pulling a comparator data set from the observational study. And so it provides uh, not as rigorous a control as a placebo, but, uh, but certainly the best control that we can provide for an open label study. So in the left hand, uh, graph where we're showing uh, time to stand in seconds along the x-axis, you see uh, the baseline and then progressive time, uh, time points up to 109 weeks, which is the point where the data was uh, pulled for this presentation. And uh, going toward negative numbers is, of course, an improve is is improving in, in the seconds because that means it takes less seconds to time for time to stand. And what you can see is that there is a significant difference uh, um, at all time points, but, but certainly out at 109 weeks between the comparator group, uh, which is not treated with Viltilarsen and the Viltilarsen treated group, which is in navy blue. And of course the uh, direction of improvement reverses for the velocity. Um, and so with Viltilarsen, you see an increase, an initial increase in the velocity of time to stand that then stabilizes as compared to the uh, progressive decrease in velocity that you see in the natural history comparator group. Next slide. And this shows a very similar set of data for the time to run walk at 10 meters. Uh, again, a, um, 
the seconds is on the left-hand graph and the, the uh, velocity is uh, shown on the right-hand side or the right-hand graph. And uh, the uh, navy blue line is the Viltolarsen treated. Uh, and you can see that, that uh, there is an initial decrease in the seconds required and an initial increase in the velocity um, with stabilization maintained over time compared to the external comparator group. Next slide. And uh, finally here, just showing you the results of the six minute walk test. Um, and uh, in the Navy Blue Viltolarsen group, you can see a, a stabilization in the distance walked in the six minute walk test. Um, there uh, is, um, uh, in comparison, a, uh, um, a slow decline uh, in the untreated comparator group. Next slide. So this uh, this uh, chart shows you the uh, what are called treatment emer emergent adverse events. That means anything adverse that happens to a participant um, uh, after the start of treatment. It doesn't have to be related to the drug, um, and so not unexpected for a two year time period with uh, um, uh, children. Uh, all 16 participants in the study reported um, uh, adverse events, um, but only one, one child reported a tr drug-related adverse event, um, and actually that um, one um, event was the infiltration of an IV line, so not really technically related to the drug, but more to the procedure of administering the drug. Uh, next slide. And so then this uh, uh, chart gives you uh, an idea of what uh, some of the adverse events were. Uh, and you can see there are mosquito bites, coughs, falls, headaches. These are, are the typical um, uh, adverse events that we all experience through life and um, uh, not particularly deemed to be related to the study drug. Um, so overall, the safety profile was really uh, has been really excellent with Ilta Larson. Um, next slide. So in conclusion, uh, um, <clears throat> I am um, reporting to you that in a uh, in this initial phase two study, the treatment with Viltolarsen in patients with Duchenne amenable with deletions amenable to exon 53 skipping resulted in significant increases in dystrophin production uh, as assessed by um, analysis of dystrophin expression in muscle tissue. Um, but importantly, uh, this correlates with a clinical um, outcome such that using time function tests as markers of clinical efficacy, the effects of Viltolarsen were maintained over this long-term study over uh, at least two years compared to a decline that we saw in the historical control group that was matched uh, on all the key eligibility factors, uh, for example, age and also uh, steroid treatment. The safety pro profile of Viltolarsen over the long-term study was similar to that observed um, in the initial 24-week uh, study. Um, uh, and based on these results, um, we can conclude that Viltolarsen is an important treatment option for patients with Duchenne who have a deletion that is amenable to exon 53 skipping. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you all for your attention. I certainly want to thank the participants for, in this study. And I'm going to hand it back to Ryan and Eric. Thank you, Dr. Clemens. Um, just add a, a quick question. We don't have long, uh, time for a, a long Q&A. Um, but that's, that was very, very positive uh, results. So we're, we're excited to see that. Are, are, um, are we going to continue to, to follow these patients? And, and will we have opportunities to you know, see this data even further out to see how the impact of, of Viltolarsen? Uh, we will, actually. Uh, so um, the 
in, in this extension study, the participants have the opportunity to continue up to 216 weeks of treatment. Um, and then after that, they have the option to move into a further long-term extension study. Um, at that juncture, um, the U.S. patients are transitioning to commercial treatment and will follow um, with some continued uh, collection of outcome measures, but hopefully trying to sort of progressively decrease the burden to the participants in the study. Yeah. Um, but we're really um, happy that a lot of the participants are able to continue um, in, in the study and will give that really long-term treatment effects that, that we all want to see. Oh, great. Uh, thank you. And what we'll certainly look forward to that. And thank you for sharing that data update with us. Um, we greatly appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much.